Please rise as we begin this time of Monday Thursday worship, singing hymn number 445, When You Woke That Thursday Morning. Poor, sinful me. 
God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Amen. Do you believe that the forgiveness I speak is not my forgiveness, but God's? Yes. Let it be done for you as you believe. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go in peace. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Exodus chapter 24. Then Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws. They responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he set young Israelite men, and they offered the burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls, and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, and they ate and drank. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 9. But when Christ came as the high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifers sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living, that is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves, together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all of the people. He said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please rise for our gospel reading. 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated as we continue now by singing stanzas 1, 3, and 4 of hymn number 636, Soul, Adorn Yourself with Glass.
Holy Spirit would speak now through this message, as you speak through your very words of Scripture. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when we as Lutherans gather for worship, whether we're gathering separately like we are now, or we're having the privilege of gathering together publicly for worship, when we as Lutherans gather for worship, we come together for God's deeds. We come together for God's service, His divine service literally to us. God's divine service to us from beginning to end of service. From the speaking of those words and the invocation, the speaking of God's name over you, that reminder of your baptismal identity as his child, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. So from the invocation to the confession and forgiveness of our sins by the power and authority of Christ himself, to the service of the word where the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the scriptures, that God-breathed word that is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, that transforms us by the renewing of our minds. From the service of the word to, of course, culminating in the service of the sacrament. Holy Communion, the Lord suffered the sacrament of the altar where Christ feeds us with his own body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins, as we are reminded in tonight's reading from Matthew 26. See, worship is God's deeds, God's service to us from beginning to end, and he serves us in even more ways than the ones I mentioned. As Paul says in Acts chapter 17, God is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything Else, and that includes through our times of worship together. And yet, on this Monday, Thursday, 2020, something is missing, right? Something is absent from our normal God's esteems. And furthermore, I'm sure that there is an added layer of longing for many of us on this night when Jesus first instituted his supper, where we long to be together, right, in koinonia, in fellowship with, in communion with each other and with Christ. As Paul says of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 10, after all, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in, a koinonia, a communion with the blood of Christ. And is not the bread that we bring a participation in, a koinonia, a communion with the body of Christ. We long to be in koinonia with each other, and even more importantly, with Christ on this night. As we would receive his body and his blood for the forgiveness of our sins and the strengthening of our faith. We long to receive this means of grace. And yet, here's the neat thing. And we understand as Lutherans about God's means, brothers and sisters. Here's the neat thing about the means of grace that we receive through our times of God's means. And what do I mean by the term means of grace? Well, let's go back and kind of refresh our catechism for a moment. Maybe it's been a while. 
The means of grace are those means by which God offers, bestows, and promises his grace. His grace, of course, meaning his undeserved kindness and favor in all the ways that he shows it to us as sinners. So the means of grace are those means by which God offers, bestows, and promises to us sinners forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. And so what are those means of grace? Well, properly speaking, there's only one mean of grace, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that good news and message of Jesus Christ, of which Paul says in Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. And it is faith that receives the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation that God bestows and offers us. It is faith that receives the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation through various means. The means of grace. As it says in the small called articles of the Book of Concord, we will now return to the gospel, which does not give us counsel and aid against sin in only one way, but God is super abundantly generous in his grace. First, through the spoken word, by which the forgiveness of sins is preached in the whole world. This is the particular office of the gospel. Second, through baptism. Third, through the holy sacrament of the altar. And fourth, through the power of the office of the key. So that is the God-given authority, which we exercised earlier in this service, to declare one another's sins forgiven as Christians. God doesn't administer his grace to us in just one form, brothers and sisters, even though there is just one gospel and one faith in that gospel of what Jesus has done for us. God administers his grace to us in its various forms, as it says in verse Peter 4. God doesn't just offer, bestow, and promise to us forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation through Holy Communion alone. He administers His grace through baptism as well. And He administers His grace even apart from baptism, even apart from Holy Communion. He administers His grace through the power of His spoken, living Word. He administers his grace through the word and sacraments. That's why we as Lutherans like to talk about word and sacrament ministry. The means of grace. As much as God wants us to hunger for his supper, which is absent here tonight, and we do, and all the more perhaps during this time of quarantine, As much as God wants us to hunger for his supper and not despise it, and Luther describes despising the supper in this way, he says, I call it despising Holy Communion when people with nothing to hinder them let a long time elapse without ever desiring the sacrament. You have to worry that whoever does not desire or receive the sacrament at the very least around four times a year despises the sacrament. As much as God wants us to hunger for the supper and not despise it, we are by no means cut off from the body of Christ, his church, when we can't regularly partake of it against our will. Or, as Luther describes it, with something to hinder us, something like the coronavirus, for example. When we can't regularly partake of the sacrament against our will, we are by no means cut off from the body of Christ. We are by no means cut off from the means of grace, the transformative, nourishing power of the gospel at the core of the means of grace. 
That's why Luther also wrote with regard to those who refrain from the Lord's Supper for other reasons of conscience, for example. He wrote, if someone has his doubts as to the sacrament, let him take my advice and do without the sacrament for the present and exercise himself without it in God's word. You are not doomed if you do without the sacrament. Because it is the gospel in its various forms that is the power of God for salvation to everyone who what? Everyone who believes. When we can't regularly partake of the sacrament, when we can't partake of it as often as we would like, we are by no means cut off from the body of Christ. We are by no means cut off from the means of grace. So here's the neat thing about God's means, brothers and sisters. Tonight, on this Monday, Thursday, so strange, 2020, even as we long to be together in koinonia with each other, even more importantly, koinonia with the body and blood of Christ. Even as we long for these things, God is super abundantly generous in his grace to you anyhow. The power of his living spoken word, the gospel, is still bestowed for your consolation anyhow. This evening, our Lord says to you, I know that you long to gather in this place, this Holy Week weekend. I know that you long to be nourished by my body and blood. And I love the fact that you love these things, and I love the fact that you hunger for these things. But I offer, bestow, and promise to you forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation anyhow. As surely as if you receive this suffering. Hear my good news to you. Hear the gospel of the Lord. Hear the living word of the Lord. All who believe and are baptized will be saved. I promise you. This is God's deeds to you. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I promise you. This is God's deeds to you. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. They have crossed over from death to life. I promise you, this is God's deeds to you. And neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, not even coronavirus or quarantine, will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus your Lord. I promise you my super abundant grace to you. This is God's deeds to you. Sacrament or not. Amen. Father, 
On the night when he was betrayed, Christ Jesus humbled himself to stoop down and bathe his disciples' feet. May each of us fervently desire to embody this attitude of service and kindness to all, that the love of Christ may abound through all our speech and actions. Hear our prayer and humble us, O Lord. On this night, Christ prayed that his disciples would be one in faith, sustain our unity in confession and doctrine, that the church may stand as a beacon of your eternal truth. Hear our prayer and unite us, O Lord. On this night, Jesus prayed for those who would hear his disciples' proclamation, that all would come to know that the Father had sent him into the world to be the light of the world. Just as Christ encouraged others to boldly proclaim the message of salvation, so also hear our prayer and renew our witness, O Lord. On this night, our Lord keeps us mindful that the Father's love was sufficient for his only begotten Son and for all disciples. Even in the midst of that love, Christ Jesus, our Lamb without defect, ultimately suffered complete and utter rejection, pain, and death. By your holy word, confirm in our hearts the secure knowledge of your enormous, unchanging love for us. Hear our prayer and fill us with your love. On this night, Christ acknowledged the world's hatred and persecution of those who confess him as Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, Fix our eyes constantly on Jesus, that we may remain steadfast in the midst of strife and harassment. Hear our prayer and grant us your peace. Amen. And we join together in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. They say, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me. For trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a posture, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. 
You lay me in the dust of death, dogs around me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Gracious Father, grant that we may put off our old selves with all our sinful deeds and put on the new person, which bearing the image of your Son, Jesus, has been given us in holy baptism, that when we let go of our earthly habitation, we may not be found unclothed, but being transformed may receive the garment of a new glorious body like his, by the power that enables him to subdue all things to himself. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of the Lord.